making a statement. Mm -hmm. oh, recording in progress. Okay. Sure. I would like to um, state that the Arcade and Marks and Wildlife Sanctuary is located on the unceded land of the Wiyot people who continue to remain in relationship with these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. They are important parts of the history of and continuing knowledge of this place. Um, this is the second of our presentation series of 2024. And um, in just a moment, I will introduce our speaker. Um, I do want to give you a My heads up. Uh, yes, please. We have Ken Burton. Coming to speak March 6th, he is a wildlife biologist and author and amazing person. He will be speaking on the people behind the names of the birds of the marsh. And the following month, April 3rd, first Wednesday, we will have Jerry Rohde, a local historian who will speak about the eastern edge of Arcata Bay and the many changes over time. And then we'll take you into May, May 1st, first Wednesday of the month again. We have David Loya. He's the community development director for the city of Arcata. And he will be talking about what the city of Arcata is doing about sea level rise. So mark your calendars, first Wednesdays of the month. I uh, just wanna set some, some house duties for people here. Um, it's okay to use the restroom if you need to. Dead ahead, one on the right, one on the left. Um, I have asked our speaker if uh, he prefers questions at the end or during, and he does not mind the interactive questions during his talk, so feel free to um, raise your hand. And I'm not sure how that's going to work in Zoom land, so maybe... I don't know, maybe I can stand back here and keep an eye on people's hands going up. Um, let's see, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dave Couch. Um, there's plenty to say about Dave Couch. Um, tonight, he is going to talk about the wastewater treatment and where it's been, where it's going, and all of the incredible updates that are that have been going on. And he is also the vice president of our phone board. So without further ado, please welcome Dave Cow. So I've been with phone for a while. <laughs> I was the, the first the first president of the board when I was actually the only member of the board too. So. <laughs> Spent a lot of time sitting on steps of city hall waiting for meetings and no one would come to the meetings. <laughs> so we've grown a lot in I don't know, 20 years or long have we been around? <laughs> Maybe you start with you. I can't remember. <laughs> it wasn't part of my talk. I just was a wing of that. Anyway, so I, I, I was going to give a, what I call my wastewater talk. So we'll start off with a kind of why we treat wastewater. So uh, historically, prior to wastewater treatment, raw, raw waste would just be put into receiving waters. And it causes this process called eutrophication, where there's nutrients in wastewater and they break down and stimulate biological activity in the receiving waters that are way beyond what would normally happen. And that usually leads to uh, dissolved oxygen levels falling at night to zero. And so that kind of kills off all higher life in the waters. And so waters historically that received waste and, and, and eutrophied would become just bacteria, fungal Latin waters with no higher forms of life. And if those are receiving water like a river, there would be miles and miles of that where the river is actually acting as a treatment system and eventually it would degrade cover. But you know, in the old days, we just used our natural bodies of water as, as treatment processes too, and that greatly impacted them. So the Clean Water Act came out in 1972 
and it was the federal answer to uh, to water pollution control, and you know it was supposed to to clean everything up. So the Clean Water Act uh, was a federal act. Uh, it was written by Senator Muskie, who was a Democrat from Minnesota, I think, and then it was Maine. Okay, got the M right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Anyway, then it was uh, signed into effect by President Nixon. We don't think of Nixon as a great environmentalist, but because he signed the Clean Water Act, it was a, a pretty big deal back then. And uh, when the Clean Water Act came out, it was a majority for the few years when they were putting the funds out of it, that was the majority of the federal budget was actually to pay for the Clean Water Act stuff. So it was a, it was a, uh, an 80% grant from the federal government if you needed to upgrade your wastewater system. But the goal of it was to make sure that all uh, wastewater systems in the country made it place secondary levels of treatment. And a secondary level of treatment is like a 80% removal of uh, constituents, like primary constituents that we look at or something called BOD or biological or biochemical oxygen demand. And that's, uh, basically, when you put waste into water, bacteria break them down, the bacteria need uh, oxygen. So a measurement of that is the BOD or biochemical oxygen demand. And uh, we don't want to have a lot of BOD in receiving water because once again, it makes the water go anoxic and kills off everything that's in it. So ideally, we would treat BODs before we discharge them into receiving waters. And then the second big thing is something called total suspended solids. And that's just to measure how, how many solids are in the water. If you run a total suspended solids take test, you take a sample of water, like 100 milliliters, run it through a, a glass filter fiber that's been dried out and weighed prior to sending it, sending the sample through it, then we dry it out and reweigh it. And so that value that you get from that is the total suspended solids that are in the water. And typically, wastewater is going to have a value of two to three hundred on both of those. And our uh, discharge permits, secondary levels of treatment says we have to clean them up to below thirty milligrams per liter of BOD or total suspended solid. So that's about an eighty percent reduction in the strength of the waste that we we do under the Clean Water Act. And then we can do tertiary treatment, which is another level of treatment, which isn't always asked for the Clean Water Act kind of said everything would be at least secondary. And then in some special instances, they want tertiary treatment and tertiary treatment keeps cleaning up the BOD and total suspended solids and actually looks at nutrients that uh, if you put them into receiving waters may cause eutrophication. So usually in freshwater, that's phosphorus and uh, marine waters, it's uh, nitrogen. So if you put those things in, it stimulates biological activity and it, uh, it creates, once again, anoxic conditions that kind of kill everything off. Could you tell me what uh, BOD stands for? A biological oxygen demand. Okay. That's what I say it's a biologist. If you're a chemist, it's biochemical oxygen demands. <laughs> And, and they, the, the oxidation ponds predate this, right? Like there's, there was oxidation ponds here before the Marshall's Bill. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go through a history of the development of Arcadis system at a, at a certain point here in the talk. So let's see, going back to this. Uh, so even though the Clean Water Act was a federal act, it gave uh, states the primacy to enforce it. So in California, we have the California Water Quality Control Board. We have a main board that sits in Sacramento, and then we have seven regional boards that sit throughout the state. And their job is to enforce the Clean Water Act. And of course, the Clean Water Act has minimum requirements, but you can exceed the Clean Water Act. So of course, here in California, we kind of exceed the Clean Water Act in some areas. And uh, you know that's a good thing. Uh, one of the things that's unique to California is something called the Bays and Estuaries Policy of the Clean Water Act. And uh, that came out primarily to protect San Francisco Bay from more discharges into it. And it, it was just a blanket prohibition of more discharges into enclosed bays or estuaries. 
And if you had an existing discharge, which Arcata had, you had to uh, justify that and show why, why you had to continue to do that. So one of the ways to do that was to uh, show that you're enhancing beneficial uses of your receiving water. And it was interesting because nobody had ever really got into that until Arcata wanted to do our system here. And if you're not familiar, when the Clean Water Act came out, they had a plan for Humboldt Bay that was gonna be one big regional plant out on the Samoa Peninsula that would serve Arcata, Eureka, McKinleyville, and then had an ocean outfall and would have had pipelines going out to that plant. So uh, one of the things with when you put in a federal project like that and you have pipelines, you can't deny developers the right to tie into those pipelines. So that would have opened like all the bottoms, all the Samoa Peninsula, that would open it all to real estate development. So real estate developers were happy to see that happen, but the city of Arcata uh, was not in favor of that. And so they pulled out of this joint agreement and uh, said, we're gonna build our own treatment plant. So that kind of killed the Hubble plan, which was Humboldt Bay Municipal Water Authority. And Arcata had their own stone plant, Eureka has their own plant, McKinleyville has their own plant. And no connection in between them. So all that real estate that's farmland is kind of protected in that way. Um, let's see. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, enhancement so that the Clean Water Act. And the Bayes and Errors policy, well, you get out of that by showing that you have enhancement. And so that's enhancing a beneficial use of the body of water. And uh, for Humboldt Bay and for the city of Arcata, you know, we wanted to continue charging into Humboldt Bay. And so the city had to demonstrate that uh, we were uh, enhancing values. And so we had this long list of laundry lists of different things. And, what the, the state accepted was educational benefits that would we get. So I still like to say, well, I'm still doing the educational benefits. And, you know, we still have a lot of relationship with the university and, and, and students and professors coming in and, and using our project here. And so, so that's, uh, that was how we managed to sneak under the prohibition of discharging it on a closed phase of last year. <clears throat> so next I want to talk a little bit just about general wastewater treatment. Uh, there's what we call primary treatment, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment. Uh, when I was a kid, pretty much everybody just did primary treatment. That's where you just have an initial settling and take out most of the solids out of the water. And then you discharge the water after that. And, you know, once again, it takes maybe 60% of the solids out, which would be the, the BOD part of the water. And then, uh, well, actually the solids. For the BOD part of the water, it, it, it maybe takes 40% of the, uh, the BOD value out with, with primary treatment. Uh, secondary treatment is uh, more tr treatment. Usually we're going up to like 80% removal of, of BOD and total suspended solids when we do secondary treatment. You know, the Clean Water Act mandates at least secondary treatment everywhere. And then the most advanced type of treatment is tertiary treatment. And in tertiary treatment, we're going for removing the BOD, the total suspended solids, and then once again, the uh, nutrients that may be in the wastewater that cause eutrophication in your receiving waters. And uh, usually, once again, that's phosphorus in freshwater. And in marine systems, it's, it's nitrogen. And uh, both of those, are, we're supposed to do an 85% removal of, of BOD and total suspended solids. Uh, usually our, our raw water coming into our facility is between two to 300 parts per million in values for BOD and total suspended solids. And our permit says we have to clean it up to below 30 parts per million. Can I ask you something, Dave? Sure. So is, is that 80% removal is that the same if you're in a city that's really polluted as it is here? Or? Yeah, that's just the standard that the law is is based on. Okay. So they can they can go for more removal if if an area you know is critically important or it's going to be impacted by the receiving waters. And you know an example of that is uh, 
like in Reno, Nevada, there's the Carson River that comes from Lake Tahoe, comes down and goes to Reno and it goes into Pyramid Lake and all of Reno's wastewater goes into that and they make them do tertiary treatment because Pyramid Lake is a dead end. So they don't want to load it up with nutrients. So, so Reno has to do tertiary treatment of their wastewater, which is like 90 to 95% removal. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't say you have to do more than 80% removal of DOD and PSS. They would say, with the right, right. Okay. That's that's more more treatment than than eighty percent, and and usually that's going to look at at nutrient. You know, specifically going to look at nutrients in your receiving water. So it's not just a blanket thing. It's like you know, this is a specific case where you know we have to see what nutrients going to impact and then then address that. So getting back to Arcata. Uh, you know, Arcata, if you've been noticing the rain recently, it <laughs> had a pretty good rain. And Arcata has quite an old collection system. So the collection system is what gets the wastewater down to the treatment plant. And, uh, and, and then we treat the wastewater. And that value uh, affects how we treat the wastewater. So Arcata has a pretty old collection system. A lot of the city has what we call clay pipes in place. And Clay pipe is like this long, has a bell on one end, and then the other end plugs into the bell, and they have wax gaskets in there to make them waterproof. So the 80 and 100 year old pipes don't have wax gaskets in them, in them anymore in Arcata. So we, we have a really high I and I problem in Arcata, which means influ inflow and infiltration. So in the wintertime, we get rain, the ground becomes saturated, we get water coming in to the collection system and coming down to the treatment plant. And in the summertime, Arcata usually gets maybe a million to two million gallons a day. In the wintertime, we usually get three to four million gallons a day. And during storm events, we may get five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I can remember back when we had big El Nino storms. I'm not connected now to the plant. <laughs> Our last El Nino system, we got we had up to 12 to 14 million gallon a day wow. inflows coming down to the treatment plant. So those make it difficult to treat the wastewater because we basically just run it through as fast as we can. And it doesn't need that much treatment because it's diluted with rainwater. So when I was talking about the BOD and total suspended solids being two or 300, when we have storm events and we dilute the water with rainwater, it may go down to 60 to 100 value. And then just by running it through the system, we usually get it down below our uh, permit requirements. So one of the new things with our, our new permit that has come up now that we're rebuilding the wastewater treatment to address is uh, ammonia removal. So historically, we haven't looked at, at nutrient removal here, but our, our new permit says we have to do ammonia removal. And that's not really for ecological reasons, it's because ammonia is slightly toxic. So they don't want us to have uh, ammonia in our effluent going out. And our, our process to treat it is going to be uh, lots and lots of aerators in the oxidation ponds. And that will oxidize the water and will convert the ammonia to nitrate. So we'll still have organic nitrogen going out in our effluent, but it won't be ammonia, so it won't be toxic. May I ask a question? Where does ammonia come from? Well, ammonia comes in wastewater from the breakdowns of the waste. There's a lot of urea in wastewater, and that pretty much quickly breaks down into ammonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> ammonia can be, if you're going to, you can oxidize it to nitrate, and then it's not toxic. Mm -hmm. And so, even if we, you know, discharge ammonia into the bay, one of the uh, unique things about Humboldt Bay is it has a really high ability to absorb nitrogen. So in Humboldt Bay, the bay flushes like 90 to 95% on a tide cycle. So really Humboldt Bay reflects the offshore ocean water conditions more than it reflects what we put into the bay, what Eureka and Arcata put into the bay. When you're out there measuring, you can't really find any impact from, from our, our discharges going out into the bay. Although, because some of that is, is organic nitrogen and 
the nitrogen cycle in the ocean. We have nitrogen that comes up in the spring and early summer from ocean upwelling offshore. And that kind of what the natural phytoplankton uh, yearly cycle happens in the bay. We have a lot of phytoplankton in the spring and then the rest of the year we don't have so much. So Arcata putting nitrogen in the bay actually stimulates the biological activity in the bay. And uh, there was a study done back before I was a student here, <laughs> the late seventies by the oceanographic department. And they said that 40 to 60% of the oyster production in the bay is based on the nitrogen from Arcata and Eureka putting it in the bay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a great recycling, you know, people oh, I don't know if are gonna eat another oyster, but, uh, <laughs> but to me, you know, it's, it's a great recycling story of, <laughs> of nutrients. Okay, so now we're going to launch into kind of what I call Arcata's history, and I'll address your question when I go through this. So uh, up until 1950, uh, we just had Arcata had a pipe going out into the bay. And so we had a collection system, and then everything just got dumped right out here, right in front of where the wastewater treatment plant is, and flowed out into the bay. And uh, when I was Years ago, working on my, my species profile on the native oyster, which I wrote the Fish and Wildlife Service, I interviewed a lot of people up and down the West Coast. One of the guys I interviewed was this guy named Dave McMillan, and he was the general manager of the Olympia Oyster Company up in uh, Shelton, Washington. And that's the second biggest oyster company on the West Coast. There's coast oysters, like the giant one. And then he has a nice little company that has like 40 or 50 employees and, and is in Southern Puget Sound. But anyway, uh, Dave, who I interviewed, his father was also an oyster, uh, I guess, biologist and worked for oyster companies. So they came down here in the 1930s and tried to establish an oyster industry in Humboldt Bay based on what they were doing in, uh, <clears throat> in Southern Puget Sound. And they weren't successful, but he was telling me stories of his childhood and learning to swim in Humboldt Bay when we had this pipe going out in the bay. <laughs> he said, it was pretty gross because you know you had to dodge the turds and the toilet paper when you were swimming in the bay. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's just like <laughs> pretty Pretty amazing. Is that where the outfall pipe is now? Or have we changed it to Brackett's Marsh? But the old outfall pipe? Fairly close. I mean, that, that area looking right from. The yeah, it's, it's hard to look at old aerial pictures because none of the, the area has been so totally reshaped. It's like, okay, here's the pipe. Here's where it used to discharge. But the oxidation bond wasn't there. And you know, all the landmarks we're familiar with don't didn't exist. But, um, so. But it's pretty, pretty similar. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was the way we were back then. And uh, in 1950, we started uh, culturing oysters in Humboldt Bay. And the first batch of oysters from Humboldt Bay to San Francisco caused a massive outbreak of gastrointestinal illness. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so Fish and Game decided to tell Arcata that we had to build a wastewater treatment plant. So that was when the first primary treatment plant was built in 1950. And that was just primary treatment. Uh, in the mid 1950s, 55, 56, the oxidation bond was added to do secondary treatment. And then uh, we also built uh, what we call the second clarifier, which is another part of the, the primary treatment then. And then we also added chlorine disinfection of the wastewater before it went out into the bay. And I always like to tell people my story of uh, the oxidation pond. Uh, it was designed by this guy named Dr. Oswald, who was the chairman of environmental sciences at UC Berkeley. And he was a famous... Uh, oxidation bond expert and he designed our oxidation bond so so he did a really good job because he did that like in the mid 1950s and here we are still using it and uh the oxidation bond wouldn't have been built under modern environmental law because we you know just kind of took a chunk of humboldt bay and put a dike around it and said you know <laughs> that's our wastewater treatment and 
back then that was accepted. That I don't think that would that would fly. You know? So, how deep are the observation pile? Uh, about five to six feet. I mean, they're, they're basically the same depth as the mud flat. It's really just a, a piled up dike, and the, the mud flat is still basically the bottom of the ponds. So, so they're not they're not super deep. And so why didn't why didn't the rubber and box get nine back then? Well, it did. Oh, so okay. so back then, you know, if you were to do a you know a diurnal oxygen curve, it would be like this going up in the daytime and going down at night. And so oxidation ponds have limited things that grow in them that they have to be able to, you know, survive those low oxygen periods during the night. So usually like an oxidation pond is just going to have a, a few, well, it'll have a lot of different kinds of phytoplankton in there, but then maybe a few kinds of zooplankton that, that raise that. And, and in our pond, we used to have a lot of uh, Daphnia, which are little mm -hmm. shrimp-like water fleas. And the whole the whole oxidation ponds have turned bright red and orange. We had so many of them. And mm -hmm. when I first came here, I was working for George Allen, and he had these big plans for making money off the Daphne and the oxidation pond. So I had to drive a pontoon boat around with a big plankton net and collect Daphnia. And eventually, I got a semi-load of... <laughs> Gross and Daphnia to send down to the Bay Area to be processed into tropical fish food. And then the truck defrosted and they brought it back as it here. <laughs> I had to deal with it. That was, I think, the stinkiest, nastiest job I've ever had in my life. Was taking her. So, you had a question. Do they, they still clarinate the effluent before it goes out? We do. We do. We're getting ready to not do that anymore. I mean, chlorinate. Oh. So, so fluorination is disinfection. Yeah. So, so historically, you know, starting from the mid 1950s until currently, we're, we're about to go to switch over to our UV system. Uh, we use chlorine disinfection. So, you inject chlorine that basically kills off anything. And then we have another gas called sulfur dioxide that we inject and that neutralizes the chlorine. And so, then, then we would discharge the water. And when we're disinfecting the water, we run, you know, usually your drinking water, we run about a part per million of chlorine in that. And our, our, when we were disinfecting, we run maybe a three or a four or a five residual chlorine in the water. So there's a lot more chlorine available to, uh, to disinfect the wastewater. So then what is the sulfur, where's the sulfur at though in that? In that reaction? Uh, well, it doesn't really, you, you get a combination, you get some acids that are formed basically from the chlorine and, and sulfur. And so you get a little bit of acid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but it's a really small amount. And so, you know, we have to monitor the pH of the water and, and what we can't, you know, we have pH standards we have to meet too. So, so we don't, we try not to over, over chlorinate. Okay. So we're continuing on our Arcata history. So uh, 86 uh, was our last big upgrade under the Clean Water Act. For, and, that, and that's the plant the way it kind of has been, you know, most people are familiar with it now. Uh, that was Clean Water Act funded once again. We got an 80% grant for that. And back then, that was about a $30 million project that we did in 1986. So things we did back then, all, all the marshes were added at that time. Uh, prior to that, like I talk about, most people think of the Arcata Marsh, I think of that as the wetland area. And prior to that, it just had a well and pumped well water into it. So when we did our 86 upgrade, we actually added that as part of the treatment system. So we would pump water over there. It would go through the wetlands and then be pumped back to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we also added the uh, treatment marshes as part of the, uh, <clears throat> the plant side of the operation. Prior to that, the oxidation pond was just this big pie-shaped pond and all the cross pieces in it, it was all just one pond. So water went in one end and went out the other end. So we kind of, over the years, uh, 
the city has a lot of spoils that are developed from construction projects. So we use those spoils to make all the cross types and, and we kind of split up the oxidation bonds so we would have more control over that, as well as adding the, uh, the treatment margin as, as, as part of that process. So other parts of the, the 86 rebuild were uh, the chlorine disinfection basin we have now, we built new headworks back then. Let's see the wetlands, I said that we were added that. And uh, one of the things with that too back then was uh, our estimated annual flow was supposed to be based on 2.3 million gallons a day. So that was uh, an estimate of what the, the annual average flow would be. Once again, it's a lot less than that in the summer and more than that in the winter. But that 2.3 was the magic number that everything is based on. And so all our, our marshes or our, our pumps over at the wetlands were designed to handle a maximum of 2.3 million gallons a day. And if we had more flow than that, we wouldn't send it over to the wetlands. We would send less over there. And even in the winter time, we, you know, we had to kind of watch the weather because the, the wetlands act as a good rain collector. When we get several inches of rain, it all ends up in, in Hauser Marsh quickly through gravity. So we have to look at the weather and the amount of water we send over there. We have to pump back. So we have to add in the fact that we're going to be pumping back the rainwater. So in the summertime, we can send almost all the water over through there. In wetlands, but in the wintertime, not so much. I'm sorry, pump it back where? Back to the reflecting oxidation pond? Uh, back to the chlorine contact basin. So so we used to do uh, the way the, the 86 version of the chlorine contact basin was we had a basin with two halves. And the first half of the basin was what we call the plant side. And so that would be the water coming from the oxidation pond or the oxidation pond and the treatment marshes. Uh, we would disinfect that. And then it would go over and go through the enhancement wetlands. And then it would come back and get disinfected a second time and discharged to the bay. And, and that was uh, one of the good things that has happened with our, our, our new upgrade, or maybe it's our relationship with the, the state regulators. But they did that because uh, one of the discharge requirements was elimination of coliform bacteria. So that's what we're doing when we disinfect the water is we're, we're getting rid of coliform bacteria, which are really just indicator species of uh, you know anything potential pathogenic organisms that might be in the water that eco is easy to culture. So, so that's what the standards are written on is you know, destroying the eco life in the, the water. And, uh, so the good thing with that is uh, under our, our new permit is we're go only gonna do one pass and uh, let's see, let me regress there. The problem that we have is, is over here, we disinfect the water and we are disinfecting the wastewater and we're removing any chance of, uh, you know, infections from people that are sick because we're killing off the water and trying to eliminate waterborne diseases. But then there's lots of things like ducks and otters and they all put coliform back into the water. So the water coming back from the wetlands, we were never really worried that it was really a human health impact. But because the regulations were written on coliform bacteria, we had to disinfect it a second time because of the wildlife putting coliform bacteria. And our new permit is we're only going to have to disinfect it once. So that's a big hooray. After years, years of working on the state, they finally gave into that. Um, after, after the wastewater goes through the whole system, assuming it's operating and you can send it through all the wetlands. How much bacteria is in there? Is there much? Uh, well, it depends on, on, on where you look at it. It's like the oxidation bond effluent is going to still have quite a bit of, of, of bacteria, but as it goes through the, the different well, the, the constructed wetlands, the treatment wetlands, and then the big area over here, it, it drops on and off. And, and, and then we do have, you know, what I was saying is 
because we have so many ducks and otters and stuff. Yeah. They're all contributing more coliform bacteria that we, that we kind of like, we've always done well, but that doesn't really matter because it's, that's natural. That's in the bay too, so. Right. So the UV system will be at the brackish. The UV okay. system is going to be where the current chlorine basin is. Okay. Half of the chlorine basin is getting turned into the UV, UV system. So the flow pattern will be for it to go through the, the wastewater treatment plant and get disinfected, and then it's going to go over and go through the the enhancement wetlands, and from the pump station at the end of them, that'll get pumped up to the brackish marsh, and then go from that out into the bay. Okay, so duck poop is okay now. Duck poop is okay now. Okay. That's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> They've acknowledged that it's a natural thing. <laughs> So let's see, I'm getting back to my, my notes here. So the new permit would UV disinfection, only one disinfection, that's a big deal. Uh, the other thing is the ammonia removal requirement that we now have. So that was something the state was kind of uh, looking at and to tell you stories about the state. We have the state water quality control board who does wastewater and then we have the state water resource board that does drinking water. Mm -hmm. So they don't always, interact, you know, you think these agencies would be good working together, but you know, they're crazy. So the, the drinking water board a few years back was, you know, looking around the state and looking for future drinking water sources. And they identified Humboldt Bay as a future drinking water resource. And so it's kind of like, well, you know, it's salt water. Oh, we don't care about that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> So, so the Humboldt Bay has this ammonia removal requirement, which doesn't really come from the wastewater side, but it comes from the drinking water side. And so, you know, we, we can't put ammonia out into the bay anymore. And that's, you know, totally crazy. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> so seriously, the drinking water agency doesn't get that you don't drink salt water. I mean, <laughs> well, we could desalinate it. They also oh. don't get the fact that this area is unique in the in California and that we have a, a huge development of drinking water. There are our, our, our wholesale Humboldt Bay municipal water because they supply all the cities and they used to supply the pulp mills. <laughs> the pulp mills were like 20 million gallons a day and all the cities are like under 10 million gallons a day. So the pulp mills have gone away. So they have this 20 million gallon a day surplus of fresh water. And, uh, you know, if you read articles, you know, they're they're worried about losing those rights now. And so they're, they're talking about putting that water into the Mad River, which of course where it comes from, I don't know, you know, where it's like, okay, we're, we're taking this water out and we're gonna get credit for putting it back in the water, but they don't wanna lose future rights to that water. So that's a kind of an interesting aside. Well, it's a little confusing that they would come up with that ammonia regulation, but nobody's using the bay water for drinking. No, but, but they might. They might. They might. <laughs> they might. Be yeah. yeah. Well, couldn't we wait until the desalination plant is built and then? Well, you would think so. You would think, you know, that the, they're, they're actually building some desalinization plants down south. And, you know, maybe you see how that works out for them before they uh, make a rule that applies to the whole state. But that's, you know, that's not how they, <laughs> not how they work. One size fits all. That's right. I guess, if, you know, we, if we get a break, then everybody else is going to want to get a break too. So that's the that's the critical thing. Okay, getting back to the new system. Mm -hmm. So when we have heavy rains, Hauser will still fill up, but it can be pumped out to the brackish marsh without further treatment, so it won't be a problem. Or... That, that that is correct. Actually, we will. So Hauser is where the second parking lot is, or the, the far parking lot where the, the boat ramp is. And that, that is Klopp. Well, that Klopp Lake is the saltwater lake, and Hauser is the marsh next to it. Oh, OK, but we drive past them. Right, right. So the, the reason that there's now 
pretty big loop stations there is to accommodate more flow at the end of Hauser. Correct. So okay. so all of so Hauser, you know, it used to just be a percentage of our flow that we sent over there and ran through them. But now all the flow has got to go through them according to the state. So so we we have to, you know, I think we have like about a 10 million gallon a day pump station we're building over there, which probably will, you know, maybe see that once every five years or something. But, you know, we have to have that much pump station to deal with the flows when they happen. And that's what we, uh, so over there, we have, you can see the new weirs on the south end of the pond. So that's just uh, weirs that will allow water to pass through and they have screens in them to, to catch plant debris. And then that will go to the lift station and the, the lift station is gonna get rebuilt and have much bigger pumps in it. So the pumps will be able to handle all the, you know, the flow up to 10 million gallons a day instead of the 2.3 million gallons a day they're, they're sized for now. So that's a, a big increase. And, and all those little weirs at the end are just screens because, you know, right now the, the, the lift station over there just has one two by two screen <laughs> in front of the, uh, the pumps. And we have to go clean that a couple of times a day. One guy broke his wrist pulling it up. So it's the only, only injury I had while I was a super roster in his life. So is it from here that big black barrier thing? Uh, no, that's just so. The, so the, the weirs are actually on the south side now. There's okay. like some concrete boxes over there, and then the pump station is like under that mound. When we uh, when we rebuilt, or we should say not rebuilt, but in '86 when we did our plant upgrade, that was going to be more of a conventional lift station. And Frank Klott was our public works director back then. So at about that same time, he also built a little list station over at the corner of Old Arcata Road and Jacoby Creek Road. And you see that little box there. So that so infuriated all the neighborhood, you know, Klopp got his name in the newspaper as Klopp's flop. It's the headline <laughs> of the, the Arcata Union. So then he decided, well, we're not going to, we're going to make a little mound over here and have it be hidden. And before that, it would have been a building. So, so. <laughs> you did. You yeah. did. I read that. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I kid around about Frank, but I loved it. I mean, no, that's okay. Yeah. So, how big a deal is the um, dealing with the ammonia? Well, that's what we're, I mean, basically, the oxidation ponds are going to have like, I don't know the exact number, but 30 to 40 aerators in them. And so the aerators so are like in. Well, they're like the ones that are out there now. It's kind of like a propeller going down into the water. And it has an air blower that blows into that propeller. So it makes it like a froth of air and water that shoots out. So they don't really splash too much. But we'll have lots and lots of those. So, so the reason behind them is to convert the ammonia to nitrate. Which happens in the Can you tell me what the most? Uh, not that I've known about. They might. I mean, it is just kind of a guarded propeller. Or something. But we've never we've never found pieces of ducks or anything floating around. In there. We did have one time. Uh, we did maintenance several years ago and brought in all the aerators and we had never looked at them closely and almost all of them had turn nests on them. So oh, that's something, you know, the turns actually like that floating island as a, as a nesting site. And so that was like, oh, well, and they do have a wildlife value. <laughs> and there are fish in there, right? In the yeah, yeah. And the oxidation ponds, uh, for years and years, we didn't have fish in them. Uh, we just had you know, the, the phytoplankton and the daphnia. And that's what I was talking about in the old days, they would actually turn red and, you know, I, George Allen had me collect daphnia and freeze it and, you know, that whole story. Uh, but then for mosquito control, we introduced gambusia, uh, Dave Hall and I did that. And that totally changed the biology of the oxidation pond because the gambusia ate most of the daphnia. And so you no longer see the huge blooms we used to have because the, the little gambusia fish are in there. They, they, they crop off the daphnia as well as the, the mosquito larvae. 
Are they in all the ponds? They are in, in all the ponds. Now they are just we we only put them in the oxidation ponds, but they have spread on their own. In fact, they're even they, they're everywhere around Humboldt Bay now. They're like I guess they can survive in salt water for a limited period, so they have just pretty much spread. And, and other agencies have used them too for mosquito control. I mean, it was a it was a thing back in the eighties and nineties. You know, use gambusia. That's better for the environment than using chemicals or you know something other other things. And since then, we have found out they are voracious little predators, and they impact amphibians because they eat amphibian larva. So, like the in the Central Valley. Uh, there's a subspecies of red-legged frog that is rare and endangered. It's largely because the mosquito fish that have been introduced eat all the tadpoles. <laughs> so I think it was you know, it's a biological control. We're not totally <laughs> benign. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll get it back to so our, our new permit with our UV disinfection. We're only going to have one, only one disinfection, no double disinfection. It's going to come from the wastewater plant side, go through disinfection, go out, go through all the wetlands, and uh, then to the uh, brackish pond, and then discharge. And once again, we have our ammonia removal requirement, which I kind of talked about, I think, enough. <laughs> Any questions on ammonia? Or I, I think I got that. Yeah. Okay. So the the treatment marshes um, that are in the plant mm -hmm. are part of the they're basically secondary treatment like the oxycons are, right? Or uh, well, yeah, they're I mean they're they're a little bit different. It's in the oxidation ponds. We're trying to treat BOD primarily, and we do that because we have phytoplankton that produce oxygen, and then that treats the BOD. And then the purpose of the marshes is actually to take that algae of the water. So, so the algae counts as total suspended solids. So the, the wetlands are there to take the total suspended solids out of the water after they've done their job of, of, of treating the BOD in the water. Is there any data? Uh, I, I know there are wetlands of different ages in there. Is there any data on whether the older ones that are now floating are as efficient as when they were down in the mud. Um, I don't know. I think I think Dr. Gerhardt has had students do studies, but okay. I don't I don't know the results of them. That was that was one of his uh, his ideas was to when we had the treatment marshes was. We could increase their efficiency by raising the depth of them. And I think we were all envisioning that the depth would come up and the plants would stay on the bottom of the water, you know, would go through them and then we would get better treatment. But in actuality, when we raise the water levels, the plants all floated up off the bottom. So now we have this mat of water flowing under it. And you know, it has a different filtration value as opposed to trickling through all the plant stems and stuff. It's just like a shaded. <laughs> shaded, hopefully stuff someone's out down there. I don't know if anyone has done an efficiency <laughs> okay. study on them. We did do some studies. Sometimes people ask about, you know, did the treatment marshes treat organic? So one of the professors at HSU had this idea was, you know, what's an organic we can <laughs> Measuring again with caffeine, because there's lots of caffeine in wastewater. Imagine that. So, so the treatment marshes are, are pretty good. They take about half the caffeine out as it goes through them. So, so they are good at treating organics as well. It's, and I like to tell the story of the caffeine just because it's. <laughs> Is it hard to break down caffeine? No. I don't. I don't really know the details. I, I just know that it's one of the. It's not something. I guess it's fairly easy to monitor, and you know, you don't think think of that as a wastewater constituent, but, but it is. So. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Some of the other things are going to happen since we have all these new aerators in the oxidation ponds. 
is uh, we have to have a lot of generator support for those. So if you look over kind of on the east side of the corporation yard, you'll see a couple of buildings over there. One is a new electrical substation. And then we're going to have another really large generator station over there. And all that is to supply electricity to the aerators and the UV system in the event of a power outage. So we have an existing generator that can run the current treatment plant, but it's not big enough for you know, all the new electrical appliances we're getting. So we have to have another giant generator over there. Do you know how much energy we're using compared to the cameras that are kind of conventional for a treatment plant? Um, well, we're better, we're kind of better than a, most conventional treatment plants because a lot of our, our treatment comes from solar energy. The oxidation ponds and marshes primarily get solar energy. And so, um, you know, that's what, yeah. I would say 50, maybe 40 to 60 and then type range. The water has to be pumped from the house to the brackets just because the house is too low, right? Yes. Well, that was the way that was the way the plan <laughs> developed. Yeah. You know, I kind of wish I had years years and years ago the plan was to have it go through Hauser and then just go into Clop Lake and then out of Clop Lake into the channel and I wish I had stood up and said, why don't we do this? This was, you know, the plan 25 years ago, but since then they built the brackish marsh and the brackish marsh isn't brackish unless we put some fresh water into it. So that, that became part of the plan. It's not, not the most energy efficient, you know, way to do it. So. Mm -hmm. Why was Clock Lake ruled out? As an outlet. I mean, now that you mention it, it sounds like it's a great solution. That, 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 that was the plan when I came here yeah. 30 or 40 years ago. And I think I think it just it's it's kind of politics of having you know the brackish marsh got built. And so for it to be brackish, you know, right now without us putting water into it, it's just marine, it's just bay water, so it's really a salt water pond. So have it be brackish marshes, we have to put wastewater into it. Okay. And that's <laughs> just, <clears throat> just the way it developed. You know what our energy efficiency was in that period of six? No, I don't, I don't have any great numbers on, on the energy efficiency. We'd like to say that we, we do better when there's conventional wastewater treatment plants that are um, use basically aeration as as their you know their activated sludge process, and so basically what the wastewater goes into a basin, and you continually aerate it, and you build up like a large bacterial load that lives there and stays in suspension from the aeration, and that treats the BOD and total suspended solids, and then you have a secondary clarifier after that to take that material out of the water and, and that's that's an activated sludge process which is what 95 percent of the plants in the country are, are activated sludge and it's not real energy efficient because you're you know you're using energy to, to oxidate the water as well as to keep all the bacteria in, in suspension and so we've always said you know our plant is like 50 to 60 percent more efficient than an activated sludge plant because we don't we don't have to do that. But we, we also in the past didn't have to do what we're going to do now, which is put all the aerators in the pond too to convert all the ammonia to nitrate. So that that you know it's going to cost a lot of electricity to do that, basically. And we don't have any real good areas for any large scale solar arrays to produce electricity for for the, the system down here. We did that in the Kinleyville where I go before and you put in a, a solar array. So our, our plant is freestanding up there. Mm -hmm. Batteries and, and a solar array. 
Okay, so we're going to talk now, I'll get back to my, my notes here, uh, pump stations at the treatment plant. So uh, all the pump stations over there are going to get rebuilt. Uh, basically, that's the one that takes water from the end of the, the treatment marshes and uh, brings it over to the disinfection facility, which is currently a chlorine disinfection facility, but which will be the UV disinfection facility. Uh, we have to replace the pump station over at the end of Hauser Marsh just to make it bigger. Uh, other things we're going to do is our, our headwork structure, which is the lift, the tubes, the screw pumps that lift the water up. And then we have bar screens and grit removal. We're going to build a whole new headworks because that's basically worn out. So that'll be a, a big chunk of what we're going to do over there. Uh, our clarifier that we used was built in 1955. So we're gonna to totally rebuild the clarifier just because something built in 55, the concrete's not so good anymore. Okay. What's the funding source? Well, the funding source is, uh, you know, I was talking about the Clean Water Act earlier and how it was a grant program. So there aren't any grant programs anymore. So, there's an agency called the State Revolving Fund, and that was who administrated the Clean Water Act grants in the old days, but now they just have money that they get from the state and the federal government, and they give it out as low interest loans. So, so the city's got like a 2% loan for all their, 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 their wastewater grants. And what's their payback? I don't I don't. Know that. But that's not a grant, so the rate payers. The rate payers, yes. The rate payers will pay. Which is us. Which is it. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and that's why I was talking about solar. Yes. Solar is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In McKinleyville, we have like a series of oxidation ponds. And, and then when we, we upgraded our plant a few years back, we went to a uh, Kind of it's a low tech uh, activated sludge system where we just have a, a lined pond and it's got a blowers that blow air through pipes that drop down and, and they kind of move back and forth. And it's, it's a real low tech kind of uh, activated sludge that's inexpensive. And, and so we, we went to that instead of our, our uh, oxidation ponds. and. So we have an area that we converted to solar, you know, it's so a big solar array that's large enough to run the whole treatment plant. So it would be great if you get a tour uh of Hill in comparison. Uh, I might do that sometime. Do that. <laughs> yeah. I think about that. I used to try to do yeah. yeah. I used to try to do that and then do like a tour of the Eureka treatment plant. Yeah. That Eureka, Eureka's got a, you know, what are they call trickling towers where they uh, take the wastewater and you see those big circular tanks behind Pearson's. They're, they're all full of plastic media. So the wastewater goes through primary treatment and then they take it to the top of those tanks and it trickles down over that plastic media and that acts as an attachment point for bacteria to treat the waste and then they do a secondary clarification of that and then that's that's their treatment process so so we have a kind of a, a good variety of plants around here we used to try to do like you know multiple tours but we'll follow up we can do it again it's like, <laughs> they haven't gone away at the end of the Eureka process, don't they is there an outfall into the bay opening? So is that in the ocean? They they try. They try to do that. So it's a, it, it discharges there and they're only supposed to discharge on outgoing tides, but then some of the studies found that it goes out and then it comes back in. So, <laughs> so it doesn't probably matter, you know, what they do, I mean how they discharge it. Mm -hmm. But but they they have you know a good treatment plant too. And so anyway, that's it for uh, <laughs> unless we got questions. Yeah.
Well, it wasn't too boring, but no, no, it was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe you're very cool. Far. <laughs> so much. Well, since I did it for 30 years, it's like, <laughs> well, I keep thinking in, in because of the time we live in, that a solar array would be perfect to run all these new pumps. Could you, could you cover a marsh with a solar array? Like some of the, the treatment marshes, you don't want sunlight in them. Uh, well, you kind of want sunlight. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could redesign them where they would have that as, as in lieu of the plants. <laughs> or, or just make a dedicated area for, for, for solar. You could do that. You're retired now. <laughs> well, I got McKinleyville to do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the board for the McKinleyville Community Service District. So when I talk, that's why I get I get to have decision making authority up there yeah. as opposed to just being an ex employee of the city of Arcadia. There might be questions on. Oh, uh, any Zoom questions? I've been looking for chats, but nothing. Okay. Well, thank you. More than you wanted to know about waste. Yeah. No, that was the goal. That was the goal. That was the goal. Do you use any block to drop solid out, or is it just drop naturally? Just, just drops naturally. We don't, we don't use any. And your tertiary numbers are what? How many parts per million? You know what? Your tertiary treatment numbers are how many parts per million? Uh, well, tertiary treatment is going to be if you look at BOD or total suspended solids, which is kind of what we do most things there. It's going to be like ninety to ninety-five percent for tertiary treatment. But the thing with tertiary is you're trying to remove the nutrients. There's this uh, term from limnology called Liebig's law, the minimum, and it says that in any aquatic system, there's usually one nutrient that limits the productivity. And that's where I was talking about it. in freshwater, usually that's phosphate and in marine systems, it's nitrogen. So so that's that's what you know contributes. Thank you. Zoom question. Okay. It's Andy. <laughs> um I sent Maria some photos. I'm wondering what the structures are that are between the two oxidation ponds. There's some metal um frames that are put in there recently those hi andy the, those look like future electrical hookups for the aerators that are going to be in the ponds yeah because there's i don't know there's probably 10 or 12 of them that are across the stretch across there so, yeah there's, there's going to be like 40 aerators oh. out there Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. We have a chat question here. Okay. Do the anaerobic digesters need to be upgraded as well? Will changing from chlorine to UV change anything? Well, that's two questions. So the anaerobic digesters, we're, we're not addressing them as, as part of this, uh, this rebuild, except that hopefully, uh, when we upgrade the clarifier, we'll have a, a better, more stable food supply going to the anaerobic reactors. And then the second question, will changing from chlorine to UV change anything? Well, I didn't talk about it, but when, we, when you chlorinate wastewater, you get lots of little byproducts and uh, things like trichlorohalomethanes, and uh, all those are, are regulated. And, and the city is usually in violation of them. In fact, anyone who uses chlorine is in violation of those standards. So that's that's why we're going to the UV is to get away from the chlorine byproducts that are, that are created. And, and, and even though we dechlorinate the water with sulfur dioxide, it doesn't take care of all the chlorine compounds that are, that are created by chlorinating the water. So that's that's why we're going away from that. Will we move fully away from chlorine or will chlorine still be a part of the system? The goal is to eventually move away from chlorine. Uh, when the UV goes online, we're going to still have chlorine available as a backup in case, you know, what we learn the UV, if we have, you know, a need for the chlorine, we'll be able to uh, use it. But, but eventually we want to get away from the chlorine totally. 
and and some some of the engineering plans are to even to <clears throat> as we get it UV up instead of using the gaseous chlorine is to have uh, big tanks of chlorine bleach there, and so that would be less hazardous than the compressed chlorine gas for for long term storage. Hmm. Hey, well, I think those are the questions. Well, thank, thank you. Do you need to be in March as well? <laughs> <laughs> so what's tomorrow? Board meeting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. If I remember. Goodbye, everyone. Anything you want to say or say? Nope, we did it. We did it. We did it. <laughs>